I'm Adam Egypt Mortimer, and this is Scream Dreams. Like How old that? are you guys? I'm 35. I'm 52. 31. No, you No, you are not. Yeah. Yeah. I would have guessed 36. Well, what the fuck? It's the so then all that shit is boxing. working, right, Barbara? It's the meditation. All that yeah, it is. Me, she said, is it working? Yeah, it's fucking <laughs> working. Oh, my God. I teach a group of... Uh, guys and girls how to box and they're all 10, 15 years younger than me and I kick ah! asses. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> I love that. Hello, friends. Welcome to another episode of Scream Dreams. I'm James A. Janice and with me as always are Barbara Crampton and Catherine Corcoran. Woohoo! <laughs> I'm sitting in this chair today. Just briefly. <laughs> Our guest today is Adam Egypt Mortimer. This guy is a creative, sensitive, and very bold director-writer. He helmed music videos in his early career and directed his first feature, Some Kind of Hate, with Scream Dreams alum, friend of the show, Sierra McCormick. He then directed and co-wrote Daniel Isn't Real, starring Miles Robbins and Patrick Schwarzenegger. Arch Enemy, starring Joe Manganiello, was a high point with Adam deconstructing the superhero. He's here to talk to us today about a new project, and I know one of the dark themes of the show, What Scares You, will resonate with him. Thank you, Adam, for being here today. Come on down, Adam. Woo! You get to take the big boy chair. Excellent. Hey, Adam. Oh, my God. <laughs> Nice to see you. Thank you. Oh, I feel so rude. I was the only one who didn't get up. I'm sorry. Is my mic okay? <laughs> like, how yeah. would, would you like it to be better? Chris, a better I mic? We should I, be jewel, be bedazzle it. Be a better it. mic. Okay. These are better mics than we've had. Yeah. I was right. just talking about those mics that have silicone ears on them. What? Have you seen these no. mics? They're extremely like Cronenbergian. It's like a really, it's a binaural mic. It's like a metal, regular microphone, but both sides of it have silicone human ears. Like human ears? Really? Oh. So you can like whisper in the That's crazy. Ear. I've never seen that. Because yeah, they're I, very popular on Twitch channels for oh, ASMR. Really? Well, when you oh. said that, I imagined the headphones with the little cat ears on them. No, no, this that's... isn't like, this is like so beyond that. It's so weird. <laughs> yeah, this is very Because you can that. like tickle the ear, like uh, whisper I don't like it, it, and like. Oh, no. Are they like, and goes, do they feel fleshy? <laughs> I mean, I haven't uh, actually used one, to be clear. Like I've only mm. witnessed them uh -huh. from the safe space of my home. <laughs> Where uh, do they get them? I, you get them on Amazon. It's like a professional, it's like a We're, popular Everybody's looking thing this up now. right now. Yeah. 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 Like I'm going to come in next time. They, you guys are all going to have. They're going to sponsor yeah. us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, I don't know why that gives me. Yeah, like, you're freaking out. I don't well, like it is a weird thing to take, to take a human body part uh -huh. and then just have it like totally re contextualized in a way, you know, like that, it's freaky. I Especially if you can use it, it makes you feel vulnerable. It makes you feel what like- What do you mean I, use it? It's like, well, how, how does it function? Because it, it's a it's a microphone. Oh. So you're talking like into oh. the ear itself. We have it up there on the screen. Oh, it's, it's being pulled we up. We can see it, but Oh, you can't. I don't yeah, like yeah, it yeah. at all. Yeah. Catherine, avert your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> you can't go to the Wikipedia article for ASMR. <laughs> <laughs> it's blocked. We don't want you get, getting any ideas. Yeah. Psst, yeah. No, ASMR, the ears. Look no, up it's, the ears. It, ASMR is its own thing. Yeah, ear it, it's microphone. ASMR, ear, like, ear like a binaural ear, ear microphone. microphone. It, it really looks like something you'd see in like a... These are like earbuds. Oh, oh no! Yeah, yeah, like no, no, I don't like them. Yeah. I don't oh, like that them. That is strange. I don't like the girl with her mouth in your head. Weird. I don't like it at all. Yeah. I don't like it at all. But it's now become... Oh, yeah. oh my God. See, I don't like it. Uh See what I mean? Doesn't it look like they yeah. had? It's like s s some cybernetic monstrosity where they yeah. grew ears in a vat. And did you ever yeah. see Spy Kids? Like I the movie where Spy they go? Like, it's like uh, it's a. I think it's actually Rodriguez who does it, it but yeah. it, they like they go to this like land. And it's almost like Pee Wee's Playhouse esque, and they like have all these weird creatures that are like one arm on like a weird like body. They're like oh, floating. I've seen some of these, and like yeah. it looks like it would exist in the, some people. Are there yes, some, the people? some people? That's right. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, She's whispering like in the ear. I don't like that's, it. Right, yeah, oh, whispering thing. Whisper. That's the, is, the whole is, experience. It's supposed to cause tingles. Whispering in it. Yeah, and maybe and maybe you'll tear up a little piece of paper. Like I said. I spent, Amy and I spent a day on Twitch, like looking at all of this stuff. And like some people will be rubbing a Your girlfriend, Amy. It, my girlfriend, Amy Nicholson, who's a wonderful film critic yep. and writer. Um, so we watched all these videos and some of them will be like somebody touching a balloon and making like mm -hmm. quiet squeaky oh, sounds. They make me really uncomfortable. Like, I really don't like so it. It's so weird. It's like if a golf announcer 
was also like an erotic book narrator. <laughs> like, it, right. I don't know why that seemed like a good idea, but millions of people love it. Or like, it. they'll just oh. do like a little. Yeah. yeah. Wow. The, uh, the little well, like nails on the. Well, so thank thanks. you for coming to my uh, my binaural ear talk. Yeah, yeah. yeah thanks now for joining us today. <laughs> this is now what? a show only done in ASMR. Oh, I first met you on the film <laughs> fest circuit. Yeah. I think you had some kind of hate. I think I met you at Fright Fest in London. Okay. Did, were you there for some kind of hate? Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. That's what I'm remembering. I was. I, my, so with that movie, what I was extraordinarily lucky with the way certain things worked out with that because we were making this movie, really low budget, my first feature. Yeah. So hard to make your first feature. Your expectations and, and resources keep going down the closer you get to actually. Do, like we had a minute where we thought we were going to make that movie for a couple million dollars. And a financer sent us to Vancouver to start working on it. And we were there in Vancouver casting, location scouting, and like the money never came. Arrived? And we were oh. just fronting it ourselves with a Briggs loan that we got. And like literally we lived there for uh, like probably two months. Waiting and then for the money to come in? Waiting, being told that the money That's to start. That's crazy. Sh- and like spending money on a casting director and all oh this stuff. God. And I had a whole cast. Yeah. And I was so excited making this movie. And then like. We just we had to take a break and go to Washington State and kind of camp out for a minute, still hoping the money would come in. Like we were, we bought one giant salmon uh, that came with uh, like because it's farm area. It was Bellingham, Bellingham, okay. Washington, and we bought a fish that came with all of this salmon roe, and we were just eating salmon row and you didn't have any money, for so you're weeks just, oh and we were God. staying at a place that was a pumpkin farm so it was just like pumpkins who, who was we you me and amanda else? my wife okay. at the time yes amanda i know pumpkin amanda. salmon and quinoa that's all we could afford that's all we had it was just weird i'm just just i'm just trying yeah. to set the no, picture no, no, of the no. desperation <laughs> yeah right and then finally it was like no you're not getting the money at all this particular financer is just a total con artist and we had to drive back and then put it back together and and, and, so and, and drove, did, drove back to where? Bro, drove back to LA. We drove you back did. to LA. And we had made such a big deal when we were like, goodbye, everybody. I'm off to shoot my Ooh. first feature film. Oh, I shall I, see you on the other, you know. And then I didn't hear back. this story. Oh, yeah, this so, is terrible. Oh so who God. came through with the with the next money? Well, my producers, which was Amanda, Gabby, um, Lugo, and my co uh writer Brian all went to people and were able to get a little bit of money. Yeah. Did you wind up with a lot less than you expected? Yeah. Well, we wound up with 200,000. Oh. oh, so an order of magnitude less than what exactly. you Exactly, yes, yeah. yes, <laughs> yes, it was, uh, it, yeah, we, we were logarithmically worse off. <laughs> yes. Um, and so, but so then I got to shoot my first movie, which, you know, is an experience all on its own. And at first, like we applied to a couple festivals and it wasn't really going very well, but then we were able to show, before the movie was done, we took it to Fantasia where they had, uh, as part of the Frontiers project, they had works in mm-hmm. progress. And Noah Segan, mm-hmm. uh, friend of the room, I'm sure, um, who had been in my movie, helped us you know, put it in front of Fantasia. So we were able to show it a, a work in progress. And that was, and it was probably like in exactly however many years ago from today, 11 years ago or something, because it's always Fantasia is happening right now. It's yeah. July when we're recording this. Um, and it completely changed my life. I'd never been to a film festival before and like going to a festival, like in the same program as us, um, Aaron Moorhead and Justin Benson Mm -hmm. were showing, um, you know, work in progress of spring. So it was that, it was that time. And like, and I met Sam Zimmerman for the very Mm -hmm. first time. Um, and was that Shudder? Yeah, he's at Shudder now. At the time he was, uh, uh, he was a writer, a writer a for, I can't remember if it was Lady Disgusting or Shock Fangoria. Shock Till You Drop. Shock Till You Drop, something like yeah. that. Mm-hmm. And then he started, he really liked Some Kind of Hate, the, the film, and was telling other festival programmers about it and all this stuff. So then next year when it was finally finished, we played it at um, Overlook, which is, we were both oh. at Over, uh, Maybe Overlook. that's where Not I first Overlook, met the you. the Stanley Film Festival. Oh, the Stanley Film, Stanley yeah, film yeah. Festival. Yeah. Before been the Overlook. Yeah. Yeah. Before it was the Overlook. And then we were everywhere. And yeah, then we were at Fantasia and we were at Fright Fest. And yeah, I feel all like I saw stuff. you at a few festivals. And at I love I loved that. And and that what one of the things that was so remarkable about that sort of moment for me was up until then, I had been a filmmaker, but working like really on my own, like a couple friends who would produce with me or whatever, but like no sense of community. Like really not where were aware. you in LA in, 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 in Los Just Angeles siloed though but in your own yeah like not really yeah. aware of what people were doing in the horror space at that time I remember seeing uh, 
Adam Wingard's movie, uh, Horrible Way to Die, mm-hmm. which really blew my mind. And I was like, oh my God, you can make like a drama about breakups and alcoholism and also have it be like a gnarly horror movie. That's really exciting. And like, I could sort of see that something was happening, but I didn't know anybody. And then post mm-hmm. this sort of like year long experience of going to film festivals, suddenly I was like involved with this whole community of filmmakers who well, were doing similar I met, things to me. And I met you right at that time. That's the time. That that's was when the I, beginning. That's and when I, I met everybody. And I thought you were yourself. already there. <laughs> you acted like you were already there. You belonged. Well, yeah. I mean, that's that, that's that thing. When you find a community that works for you, you do feel like you, you belong. belong. Like it yeah. does click as opposed to other things where you're like, standing on the edges and I'm not sure like I had been involved with like music videos and things like that right. and that was a harder world to feel like oh I really found my people like I didn't find my people I was doing work that I liked and it was cool but it was really like well, how, then how did, we did you get started this? like what did you go to school for how did you get into this whole business I went to school for um, English literature and philosophy. Nice. <laughs> that yeah. makes sense to me, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah that makes total yeah. sense. Um, weirdly, and I took one film theory class, but it was a wonderful class. I want to talk about this class because, um, so I went to school at Columbia in New York. And oh, wow. we had- I've heard of that. I had- <laughs> Small school. I went to one um, class in the film department. So to, I never went to film school. I still haven't mm. gone to film school. I still kind of want to, but we'll come back to that. <laughs> um, so I took this class that was taught by James Seamus, who is Ang Lee's writer and producer. So mm-hmm. every Ang Lee movie, James Seamus has written. Mm-hmm. And he taught a film theory class called B Movies, mm-hmm. nice. where we learned like the entire history of the structure of like what a B movie was oh, wow. from silent sort of era through, you know, the 50s and all the stuff. And, mm-hmm. But we would watch these movies. We would like, like watch like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but then we would would read like the most high end, like Lacan, Derrida, Foucault, uh-huh. you know, Adorno, like you know, like high level philosophical sort of semiotics deconstruction, applying it to the sociology of where these kind of B movies were coming from, yeah. and mm-hmm. it was it was a really mind blowing oh. class. Super, like that was were the first time. Were some of my well, movies taught in the class? <laughs> to, we, I don't remember that they were. I think mm-hmm. the ones like um, I'm trying to think of what was in the '80s. Like definitely a, a a moment that blew a lot of people. A lot of people walked out of the class when we did um, Last House on the Left. Oh, which sure. I, which I yeah. hadn't seen growing up before it's, that. It's and difficult that was, like, to watch. Yeah, it's such shocking. a harsh. Mo- I think it's an incredible movie, a yeah. work of kind of genius, but like so really hard it's one of those where it's like i wouldn't watch it now i probably wouldn't watch that movie now. yeah yeah it's like oh glad i saw it once yeah yeah Mm -hmm. we were talking about that there's some movies like that where you're just like i saw that and i wouldn't do that again can i talk for one second there's something sticking out of your i think it's just i think it's my jacket is ripped i'll just want to do that because it's like a white thing can i get a little gaffers (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah this ripped i have um I don't know. I'm, so I'm a really clumsy. Um, you're good now. No, you were at uh, uh, Comic Con. You clothes said? wearer. There yes. are people who run around with little uh, repair kits for cosplayers. They're yeah. like cosplayer yeah. medics. You should have found, found one. Oh, I, that's so cool! Yeah. Cosplayer medics. I and love it's very that. cute. And they're often dressed <laughs> up like that. a doctor or a nurse. Oh, and, oh my god, yeah. that's really I love cool. That. It's, it's cute. Cool. Yeah. I love that. If one of you guys was going to dress up like a doctor and fix things, which one of it would it be? Well, I would Barbara. be Herbert West. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Barbara's always fixing things. And like yeah, she literally I know. just fixed your I, I, I said to Catherine, your jacket's a little skewed. You never fix fixed that. my stuff. Because you're perfect. <gasps> I did. I saw, Rude. I saw your movies <laughs> so I just, Now we know who the favorite college. child is. I understand. Oh, you did. Yeah, I, I definitely <laughs> watched From Beyond when I, was in, when I was in high school. I remember watching that movie at my friend's yeah. house and being like really having my mind blown I, by that movie. Thank you. I, but <laughs> getting back to that class, I would yeah. love to have been in that class, deconstructing yeah. the B And we read, and you know, we read um, Carol Clover's of book, course. Men, Women, Men, and Chainsaws, Chainsaws. Uh, which, you know, I know it's that's fallen out of favor just because, the Has I it? guess, well, the more that something is studied, the more you go, well, that's all wrong. Here's my new theory. But yeah. it was such a, like, interesting way to look at all of those, like, you know, and this this was an era, like this was a long time ago when I was in college, and it wasn't yet like like people didn't take seriously things that weren't considered high literature and high art in the mm-hmm. way that we do now. Like mm-hmm. there was a sort of cultural shift where you know, because I remember being in like a aesthetics uh, a philosophy of aesthetics class. It was like a very high we would read Immanuel Kant and what Goethe mm-hmm. and all this stuff, and I wrote my final paper about. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And th- at that time, that felt to me like 
really transgressive and interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now I think I've come to the complete other side of it, and I'd be like, can we can we just like spend a little time talking about art? Too? Yeah. <laughs> like I get it. Like it's all good, and it has like obviously Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a brilliant movie, mm-hmm. but now I wish people had a little bit more literacy about Ingmar Bergman. You well, know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you can do sure. both. Mm-hmm. Well, am I wrong to, and I, I might be wrong about this, but wasn't originally a B movie just the second movie in yeah, the double feature? Yeah, it was the feature? second movie, and it, so it, was and it the cost re- less, less money. Okay, mm-hmm. but it was never like the lesser title. It was like there's a an A movie and a B movie because it's a double feature. But because it was lower budget and because it was playing second, there was less resources and interest in it. I see, so I it see. Sort of, so, so then you had people like Val Luton, the producer who made movies like Cat People and, yeah. um, you know, I Walk. I walk with a zombie, things like that, where like he was like, okay, we have no money and nobody cares about us, but what if we make this movie awesome anyway? And that's where you yeah. get the thing that like a lot of us kind of came from is like we can operate a little bit under the radar and therefore be more crazy. Yeah. Well, that's like what risks. Reanimator was. I mean, when Reanimator exactly. came out, we got amazing reviews from people mm-hmm. like Roger Ebert and Pauline Kael. Oh, wow. And nice. then, wow. oh, yeah, Pauline Kael loved the movie. And <laughs> that, and it, premiered at the Cannes Film Festival and then I think it went to the Sitges Film Festival right after that in Barcelona and it won Best Feature there Mm -hmm. and I was so excited I was like oh my god I've arrived here I am in this great movie that's getting all these reviews and everybody you know in the mainstream press you could talk to Amy about this was you know panning it and saying what is this Mm -hmm. garbage Mm -hmm. this is this is crap you know people there's a lot of people that didn't like it. Mm-hmm. And and I said to my agent, well, you know, I've made this movie now and it's kind of a big movie and getting a lot of attention. I, I mean, can I get some generals with people and, <laughs> yeah. you know, go to the studios and meet people? And there was like, no, no. people are like, what? What is that? We, you know? we we mirrored this. We talked about this before, but that was exactly how Return to Newcomb High was. It, mm-hmm. We premiered at the Cannes Film Festival. They uh, talked about how progressive it was. We had this queer relationship at a time when gay marriage was not legal in the United States and had just become legal in France. Did all this kind of political work around the film. We ended up in MoMA at uh, the Contender Series as one of the best films of the year with wow. like Wolf of Wall Street and like oh Blue God. Jasmine. It was like with this wild thing and critics were like, you know, this is this is a great film. This is really progressive. This is a really great film. And then like, but like nobody else cared or knew what it yeah. was. And it was just kind of this like, it's this weird dichotomy that you find. And yeah. again, like I have thoughts about those films like, you know, obviously, like as sociopolitical climates evolve, how we view things evolve, I have different thoughts about what we were doing if it was as progressive as maybe we thought it was at the time. But like, it's interesting how like you'll you'll take these risks and be applauded for it. But it really, Jamie Lee Curtis talks about that. She talks about that. If you ask her in interviews, like people will be like, what was it like to be the first like scream queen? And she'll go, it meant absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. it meant absolutely nothing for me. Like it really didn't. People were, you know, applauding this film. Um, but Halloween. Yeah. Yeah. But um, for, it didn't do anything. The thing that happened to her was she got a guest star on the love boat and she <laughs> thinks she only got that because her mom did it too. So yeah. like, yeah, right. it's really interesting. Uh, like the, well, the trajectory of things. It's like people don't know what they're looking at when they're looking at it, you know, and yeah. it's like years later people now revere Reanimator and Did, Halloween. I mean, yeah. the, that and, probably yeah. came when quicker Blue than Velvet Animator. first came out. Everybody panned it. Yeah. Roger, Roger yeah. Ebert hated Blue the Velvet. Thing. He did. Was yeah. the I just yeah. watched it again yeah. the other night. Blue yeah. Velvet. I love that movie. Yeah. It's incredible. It's incredible. And every, obviously everybody's reversed their opinions on it mm-hmm. now, but I wonder, yeah. you know, it's the same. I, it's interesting to think, I'm not sure how many years apart Reanimator and Blue Velvet were, but it's sort of of the same era. And it's like that extremely transgressive, sexual violence mm-hmm. is like, I, I don't know, when people were first seeing that within a certain culture, th- they might have been am- unable to see it as art because that stuff is so primal, what they're looking at first and only later when you go back and say, oh, this stuff has now stayed in our collective imagination for decades mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. was really saying something and doing something when pushing the limits with that stuff. But yeah, people well, people tend to freak out yeah. at that time with the stuff that was so important to be making movies about. Why do you think that is? Like, why do you think people's response is, is it because it's the unknown? Is it because it challenges like a cinematic structure? I don't know. I mean, if Reanimator came out now, if it came out tomorrow, if it hadn't been a movie before Mm -hmm. and suddenly it was a movie now, wouldn't people freak out in the same way? 
because we're back, we're maybe even more than in the 80s. Like there's this weird repulsion to sexuality in Mm -hmm. movies. Like I I feel like there's an over, there's a need to over identify with like, is this movie saying that something is good? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's a, uh, a conflation of if a character is doing something, there's a conflation with the filmmakers condoning that behavior. Whereas it's like, no, Mm -hmm. this character can be a a bad character or a a questionable character doing something. Mm -hmm. And you can depict it without saying that this is the way the world should be but rather saying like, this is the way the world is sometimes. And so I, and I feel like that's the, so it's the same reason that like when people watched blue velvet, when people watched reanimator, they were thinking like this, these movies are reveling in Mm -hmm. sexual violence Mm -hmm. and therefore the directors are terrible sleazebag people. Right. right? That's sort of the perception of the stuff. And then you get further apart from it and you go, well, Maybe, no. maybe I mean, like they could have said that about the Terrifier too. Well, I mean, people you know, with with Art Nicole the Pie would would um they would talk about like it wasn't really because it was a horror comedy, so it was like a little you know there was a little bit of a, a wiggle room. Like two there. genres that are always taken seriously. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah <laughs> but it's true. Like, but 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 people like like people were like people were protesting outside of our apartment at Cannes mm. because um. You know, gay marriage had just become legal there, and we tried to have a wedding with the two characters, oh, wow. and they tried to shut us down. We ended up <laughs> being able to do it, but they did. They shut us, tried to shut us down. And people were protesting that, and I would do interviews. It was my, you know, I was 19, 20 years old. Wow. It was the first time like I had ever. This is way before, well, not a couple years before Terrifier, and um, I like. I was the first time me doing like network interviews and things, and at the time, because of the way that the political climate was, people were trying to get me to like assign a sexuality to myself, re- admit to um, being queer, which, you know, I have no problem admitting to, but at the time I didn't really know where, like, you know, I, I was 19 years old. I, I was just figuring myself out. And um, I, and they would, you know, make comments like, um, oh, well, that's appropriately vague. Because I would just be honest. I'd be like, well, I'm 19. I haven't really dated that many people, you know? And they would go, well, that's appropriately vague. And I would just have to be like, well, isn't sexuality? Like, you know, uh, and, and that it was just this very like jarring kind of experience that like people felt that they had to assign. I, I must be this character in mm. real life. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was an endearing character. It wasn't like a bad, like a, a bad character, but like it's, I guess, a similar thing for directors. Like I, they must be these horrible people I mean, because they're covering challenging subject matter. I mean, you talked about Last House on the Left. Wes Craven is one of the kindest like yeah. humanist yeah. people who, right. who I've, I've yeah. looked at and I never got the chance to meet him but it's like that guy made that movie and, mm-hmm. and he was angry about something I mean that yeah. movie you really feel the vibe of being angry about Vietnam at the end of the movie when this yeah. middle class house is destroyed and there's blood and rape and everybody's like miserable mm-hmm. and you go this is his vision of you know if the Vietnam War was being fought here on our cute little street, you know? So it's like, you can be humanist, you can be a nice person, but you can also have rage about the world that you need to express. Absolutely. Well, John Carpenter was very involved in the, not only uh, civil rights, but women's lib movements. And he like, the uh, Michael Myers is supposed to be kind of like a metaphor for that sort of senseless violence mm-hmm. but i but if oh, you of like fighting back or something well both i mean, I mean um I, I wrote about this for the daily beast but like um particularly the the character that pj souls mm-hmm. portrays is um she's she's this woman who ch- kind of challenges um uh, Michael Myers. She's very. She set this precedent mm-hmm. that you know then goes on in, in slashers that we see all the time, where it's like the sexually liberated, confident woman is punished for being mm-hmm. the sexually liberated and confident, mm-hmm. intelligent woman. You cannot. You cannot be that. Um, you're. You're. You're punished for that. That's what that was a commentary on. And when she says like when she says to she doesn't know it's Michael Myers, but when she says you know see anything you like, it's a challenge. Um, she's challenging this fear unknowingly, but she is. And so he punishes her for it, much like society often punishes strong, powerful, confident, sexually liberated women. Right. I don't know. Where are we going from here? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, mic drop. I don't know. Yeah, that's true. I mean, but it yeah. is though. I, I think it's yeah. it's this it's this weird thing that we've like We've decided that this mu- we we've decided that this is somehow less than as a not we as a as a community, but you know 
the mainstream. Well, it's um, also interesting how somebody's great idea, Halloween, was a very particular specific movie. And then it, yeah. it did so well mm -hmm. and made so much money that then like within the span of two years, there were a hundred movies that just copied its formula. Mm -hmm. And that creates this sense of, oh, that's what the genre is. This genre is about if you have sex, you get killed and the final girl should be the sort of virginal. But it's like, th that's not because there was a, you know, that we have this thousand year tradition of, of, of poetry yeah. about these kind of heroic characters. It's because one movie did well and all of these guys were like, eh, it's pretty good. I look at this, just, you know, <laughs> yeah, and, then, and then you look that. back on it and it's like this whole structure that nobody really meant to have happen and shouldn't And that meaningful. wasn't the point. Right. That wasn't the whole point of it. Point. I always talk about that. I don't really like, and I, it's not that like, I, I don't want to applaud women for their success in a particular genre, but we've talked about this all the time. I don't really love the term scream queen and I don't really love the term final girl. Mm. And um, I just think it's like, it's, it, it negates the purpose mm. of what these are. These are great performances across the board. We talked about earlier today, a film, um, you know, a film being an orchestra mm. and like all these different instruments have to come into play. And at certain points we are, you know, the heroine and at certain points we are, you know, the baseline that carries it through and at, at both points are equally as important. And oftentimes those types of terms, final girl, scream queen in mainstream circles are used to kind of denigrate us. Yes. And, and make us paid less, offered mm -hmm. less, considered mm -hmm. less, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, well, yeah, we've and both it was written about that. I wrote an article. Yeah. About that. That's why don't, I fell in love call with me you. A scream queen. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I yeah. love it. It's just like, but it is, it's this, and I don't understand I mean, maybe you can, maybe your class talked about this or you could talk about this, but I don't understand like what, what happens in the psyche that changes that. Cause these, these things are never created in that way, mm -hmm. but something happens where like it becomes this means to limit. I mean, I think it's just money. I think it's like, you know, Sean Cunningham was like, how can I make <laughs> Halloween for cheaper and more aggressively? Yeah. And then that, you know, it's like, if you look at, correct me if I'm wrong, but Black Christmas, which like, you know, really is the template for like what you do with Halloween yeah. doesn't have any of those tropes. No, so she's, really, yeah. she's like trying to get an abortion. I really, it, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. So here's somebody I don't know personally, don't know anything about Sean Cunningham, but he also, he produced Last mm -hmm. on the Left, which we were talking yeah. about. Mm -hmm. Seems to me to be like, actually, do you know him? Like, he seems to me to be like a bad person, right? Like, yeah. well, like I, I don't know him personally. That's my vibe yeah, I've on him as, a, him as like a filmmaker and a businessman. Like, just seems like, a bad person who takes Halloween, which every time you go back in Halloween, you're like, this is so brilliantly filmed. This is uh -huh. a piece of art. There's no question. Then you watch Friday the 13th and you're like, this is absolute garbage is. made by a guy that just wants to see sexy girls get stabbed. Mm -hmm. And it, and, and I think it is, you know, having said already, like, why don't people, you know, why did people hate blue velvet? Why didn't they understand <laughs> reanimator? It's like, no, th then there's this wave of movies mm -hmm. because they could make money. And they yeah. were like, we'll put these m movies in like what used to be porn theaters because that's mm -hmm. a dying thing. And uh -huh. we'll do, you know, we'll do this and that. And, and, and I think the answer to your question is that it's driven by money more than it it's driven, driven by some by kind of cultural sure. interest yeah. and like, Oh, we're really dying to see movies of this exact structure, but they just kept making them and it made so much money and it went on for so long that it wasn't until, you know, Scream comes out in 1996 Amazing. Watershed moment. that people are like, let's think about what these movies are that we've been making now for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Why do you think the, I mean, both of you could probably speak to this and Barbara, actually, but why do you think the slasher genre continues to make the money that it does, even though some slasher films are not always, you know, the most plot i think it's driven. the it's kind of the entry level horror subgenre for a lot of particularly young males yeah uh -huh. uh, i think so it was what i was into the most as a kid and I, I out of my fan base which is composed of a lot of young men i feel like they are the ones who gravitate towards slashers and maybe it's the simplicity of them the simplicity yes you know I think it's it's accurate, yeah. uh a lot of them that do have nudity when you're a young guy mm -hmm. it's like Exciting. oh there's a chance to yeah. see that but uh, for me personally, like now slashers are uh, amongst my least favorite type mm -hmm. of horror films uh -huh. to watch now just because I'd rather have something that's not as formulaic. Yeah. Something that challenges it, me. But there's always yeah. going to be that audience there who is like – and, and it, it's also what mainstream culture at large tends to think of when you when say horror, horror movies. Yeah. There are people who are like, oh, uh, I, 
there are people who always say like these things aren't horror movies. Long Legs isn't a horror movie. And it's like, no, it clearly is. It's just that what you think of as a horror movie is so narrowly Limited, confined yeah. to Jason and Michael. And it's so much more than that. Yeah. So, I mean, my so my first movie, Some Kind of Hate, that we were talking about, is a slasher movie, yeah. right? So uh, so there were reasons that I wanted to make mm. a slasher movie. And yeah, the, the, I'm, I'm trying to, to work it on something right now, and it's a slasher. slasher. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, and, and it was... I have a slasher, too! <laughs> yeah. it, it, at that time, I think it was probably around 2012, when we started writing it, it was because my writing partner, Brian, and I, we'd written Daniel Isn't Real. Oh, wow. Man. And oh. I thought... There's no way I'm going to be able to make this as my first movie. Not in 2012, you know? anyway. So, yeah. Well, any anyway, there's yeah. no there's <laughs> yeah, no way sure. that could have it, it, because what I realized after we finished writing it was this is a little bit too expensive. Like I, you know, people are not throwing money at me to make movies. This, mm-hmm. You know, we'd send it around to some people and they were like, mm-hmm. more <laughs> jump scares, you know. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. And so I was like, okay, what if we, what if we take our sensibility and apply it to what a slasher movie is and see what that would be? Mm-hmm. And uh, um, and a really interesting thing that I've always found about that movie was in my mind, Some Kind of Hate uh, was clearly a slasher movie. There is a character who is, you know, was died in horrible circumstances and is now back from the dead killing one person after the other mm-hmm. in very bloody ways. It's, could, you couldn't be more basically slasher. But the press writing about the movie never referred to it as a slasher. They always referred to it as a ghost movie. Mm -hmm. And I think that the reason for that is because, you know, my version of a Freddy Jason Michael was a a 16-year-old girl. And so when you see this 16-year-old girl who's dead and come back from the grave to kill people, people writing about horror at the time had trouble seeing that as... And I was like, Jason's the same. Jason died and he came back and he's now he's killing people. And we would and we specifically, my aesthetic for that movie was it was specifically going to be very physical. Like she won't sort of ghost in and out of things. Or can I see her? Can I not see her? It was like she walks to the next person and starts cutting shit open. Yeah. But I, I think there was a really interesting sort of cognitive dissonance where smart some people, like when the, the guys from Fright Fest. We're mm-hmm. like slasher icon, but most people mm-hmm. writing about the movie called it a ghost story. Mm-hmm. That's really that's interesting. Yeah. And do you think it was because it was a female? I think 100% yeah. that's why. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think if she had just been like a big dude walking around, you would have just been like, oh, that's what a slasher is. But no, people see young yeah. female and they think Samara and they think like these right. other like exactly. ghost. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Ghost yeah. little that's, girl mm-hmm. stereotypes. But I didn't want it to be that kind of dreamlike yeah. thing. I wanted yeah. it to be like she has a razor blade. Yeah. Uh, my best friend, Jenna Cannell, who's also in the I thought I was franchise. your best friend. <laughs> you are also one of my best friends. I've just one known of your Jenna best a little bit longer. Been I'm demoted, sorry, Bar- Barbara. There's so much conflict in this episode. <laughs> However, you know how much I love you. This is so unfair. Um, but Jenna, um, Jenna has this film uh, that she wrote uh, and her partner directed, Ray, called Faceless After Dark that I'm also in. And it is a slasher with a, with, um, a clown in it. But she, <laughs> uh, spoilers, but because um, we are from that franchise, she is the, her character is the killer. Um, and it, it's, that's established pretty early on in the film. It's not really a secret. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the big like critiques that she's getting right now, it recently came out, is that is like, oh, but it doesn't make sense. Like, why would this girl be the slasher? And it's like, well, why wouldn't she be? Her whole point was like, she was like, if, if we can have, and she says this all the time, like, if we can have a male joker, mm-hmm. why can't we so easily have the same psychosis in well, a woman? Yeah, women don't have that. The people won't accept it. They mm-hmm. and they're always trying. I saw this um, the other day. Someone was talking about the female killers or serial killer, or whatever. Uh-huh. You know, in a movie or whatever, it always has to be explained away. Oh, there was some childhood trauma or something that happened to her. You know, why can't a woman just be a killer? Why? Why do we have to explain the inner workings of her so much? And you don't expect that of the other. Killers, the other, the other iconic yeah. killers that are male. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I, I think the best killers always do have some sort of motivation. I, I think when nothing is inherently evil, right? So I think there's always like mm-hmm. a breaking point. But it, it's, it, but it's. Well, that's what we were talking good. about with Kevin Durant. Right. With yeah. our interview with him right. about, you know, no character believes that they're evil. Right. They're always doing it for, for a reason. reason. But right? it, begs, it begs the question, if a slasher can be a man, why can't a slasher be 
Well, there's not that many female serial killers there's there's in real life. Yeah. No, I mean, yes, true. that is true. We that don't fight true. with people. We work <laughs> together. Well, when you... We fight in different if ways. You, <laughs> if you read, like, you know, sort of compilations of, like, who all the serial killers and mass murderers of the past hundred years, there is a fair amount of women, but they tend to be... Their methods are very different and... Like there's a lot of poisoning, poisoning yeah. and a lot of, yeah. and a lot of oh. nurses who purposefully mismedicate patients. Yes. Like there have been women who like have killed a hundred people. Actually, you know what? Wow. In a weird way, I'm glad to hear it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because I thought that we didn't do that. <laughs> yeah. Now yeah. I know yeah. we do. Yeah. Yeah. We're just, Everyone we're can just, be shitty. Yeah. Yeah. We Don't do, worry we're about just it. much more tactful about it. You know what I mean? If we're, we're more kill, clever. We're, we're not so aggressive. We're not so, we don't want to make a mess. We don't yeah. wanna, we're practical. We don't want to make a mess. Easy yeah. cleanup. You know, poisoning. But that's interesting, right? That it's not that the psychosis is is the gendered thing. It's the the, the action. It's the relationship well, yeah. to yeah. physicality. It's like how uh, uh, suicide tends to be like men experience more successful suicides because the methods that they tend to try are often more violent and sudden like gunshots oh. or hanging. Whereas women will more often try like overdoses, which are more uh, easily reversible or, yeah. you know, you can intervene in time and stop it. So I just How always found that, that information? um, just, uh, uh, just cause I'm, I'm very cognizant of different issues that face the genders. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I know that a lot of young men bring that statistic up as like, Oh, men experience suicide <laughs> at a, as a higher rate. So like, why aren't we talking about this more? And we should, there are a lot of things that affect young men and it leaves them isolated when they don't, yeah. those issues aren't addressed. But one of the reasons for that is like what I said, like, women also attempt suicide. It's just, they don't succeed as much. Uh, yeah. You know, do you think about suicide a lot? I don't, not at all. No, I want to live forever. He has fear. Well, you're, not, you're not going to. So have you reconciled that yet? Uh, I haven't and it sucks. We talk so, about that. That's yeah. his fear. Like we talk about it's fear. Biggest, show. That's yeah. like his biggest yeah. fear. Is yeah. what? Dying. Yeah. But what my more, I mean, it's, in, it, I feel like that's a real general, like, I feel like all fear is sort of reduced to that. But what sure. is, what is, what are you afraid of will happen Stopping when you die? Cessation of nothing. Yeah. Cause yeah. you can't wrap your head around it. Yeah. What do you think it'll be like though? Nothing, nothing. That That's the problem is it Why, won't be anything. But is that, so how does that create fear in you? Uh, cause I like being and I don't want to be not being and uh -huh. that's terrifying to me. Uh huh. Yeah. What about when you're hungry and then you're not, and then you eat and then you're not hungry. Does well, it that's... bother you to not, you stopped being hungry? No, but uh, you know, uh, when I'm, when I'm laying in bed tonight and my, I start spiraling thinking about oblivion. I'll try to bring up that metaphor in my head and try to reconcile that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I guess like for, <laughs> for me, I've like, I've really tried to visualize what that is yeah. and like, and, and come to like a lot of very imaginative sort of understandings of what oblivion is or mm -hmm. what death would be like or how, you know, and, and I've really like, because. Well, do you believe in an afterlife? Cause I feel like it's easier for people who do. And I, I don't. I mean, I don't believe dogmatically in an afterlife. Okay. I believe, I alternately believe a number of things. One of which is that we just don't understand the brain function at the time of death. So mm -hmm. one of the ways I've always imagined death is that as you are dying and your synapses are shutting down, yeah. time dilates into okay. what may as well be eternity. I got this. Yeah. And so then you, there, there you are. Maybe, maybe you've shot yourself in the head because you can't take it anymore. Yeah. One of these sad, aggressive males. And as that bullet is traveling through your brain, suddenly that might feel like 10,000 years of time. Yes. Okay. Of, of your, all of your senses slowly shutting down and now there's no sound. And so it's a subjective no light, afterlife. You could are, be. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And we don't know, you know, and, and to me, that's like a, a deeply horrific Oh, that, oh, that doesn't bring you peace. That makes it worse. Does that bring you peace? A thousand years of agony and loneliness? Oh, not, no, not the agony and loneliness well, part. So, okay, so how do you make I guess that? if it were more like a, a lucid dream, you know, if it, uh -huh. if it became that kind of experience where you can mm -hmm. do whatever, that, that would so, be somewhat so different. So maybe it does become that if you've been practicing that for all your life, if you're mm -hmm. a Tibetan monk who sure, yeah, yeah. visualizes different forms of consciousness. and th like I think that's where that idea of the relationship to what we do here and what an afterlife could be, could potentially come into play. I see. Yeah. Like neurologically. What terrifies you? Well, I think I've, I've thought about it a lot over the years of trying to like, like boil it down. Uh -huh. And it really is loneliness. Like I think about loneliness in a lot of different ways as being the, the thing that like really drives me. And to a de degree sometimes drives me 
Like sometimes I'm like, I'm so afraid of loneliness, I'm gonna wind up super lonely. Hmm. You know what I mean? Like the things that you fear the, is the thing you think about and yeah. sort of the way that you have relationships and things like that. So, so I think about the idea of death as being the ultimate cosmic expression of loneliness. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think about like, you, you know, you can't experience if you, it without. you walk into yeah. a room and nobody cares about you is also a form of loneliness or, you know, like there's, I think there's a lot of ways that it kind of, and, and what I realize is everything I've ever written and directed and it's, it's always, always coming, it's always yeah. about that. Um, it's, I did, I, I did, I, I recorded a record a couple years ago. It was just oh, this cool. like music for a, an imaginary soundtrack for an imaginary movie. Ooh. And I was playing it for Amy in the car. So excited. Here's my new record. I thought, yeah, da, 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 we're going to do this. And um, after five minutes, she was like, you have to shut this off <gasps> because I'm just looking out the window and I'm looking at all these people and I'm thinking about how they're all going to die. Oh and my I God. was like, this is the best review I've ever gotten. <laughs> 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 was that so the dark. intent? Was that like what you wanted? It's what I feel like. Yeah. Mm. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, when I'm, when I'm doing music, which I was a musician before a filmmaker, I gave it up forever. And then I, picked it up again for fun. It's like, it's such a pure expression. And I was trying to do the soundtrack to it, like an, like I say, an imaginary sort of dream horror movie. So I guess that's just what I was feeling like mm -hmm. at the time. I, and it, I feel it, like, like those expressed. sensibilities come through in Daniel Isn't Real. Uh, mm -hmm. It's yeah. a very dark movie. Um, and obviously has a lot to do with like mental illness and uh, yeah, being locked into uh, that space which could be yeah. kind of like an eternity, but totally. Yeah. I mean, imagine I, that, like imagine if, you know, you die and then you're just in a featureless ancient concrete wall yeah, with no creativity, no interaction, no love, no yeah. nothing, you know, and that's just for that you know, long. Is that what you version. think happens? I think it's a, it's a way that I visualize my fear of what happens. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. very hard for me to be like, I, I, I I know what happens. Let me now visualize it. Have you ever tried meditating? I meditate twice a day. Oh, wow. I do, okay. I Are do you... yoga. I do boxing. Okay. I go to therapy. I listen to the Bhagavad Gita almost every night when I'm falling asleep. Yeah. Like I do a lot do to try all. to just yeah. get yeah. to like a baseline of, of peace. I'm a, of peace. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. For me, it's all about like, how do you find peace? But does, so does, that stuff not help you feel it helps okay me tremendously. About being Look alone. at here I am. I'm making you movies are. and doing art and I have friends <laughs> and I love my community and all this yeah. stuff. But also <laughs> I'm going to die and look, you know, I think it's, yeah. I mean, I can't, sometimes I think like, I can't imagine what I would be like if I didn't do all of that oh. stuff. And I'm also, you know, and I take, um, an anti-anxiety, I take a small amount of Lexapro. Yeah. And I had gone off of it a couple of years ago. I was actually just rereading some of my journals in preparation for talking to you guys to be like, what do, what do I think? Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> I went through a period of unbelievable despair when I came off the Lexapro, because up until, like I'd been taking really it, bad and then things were like kicking, and I was like, life is yeah. great, like here I am, Lexapro in it up, and like, maybe I'm fine now, and I don't need this. I don't need and then, it. Like, well, you can't come off, because I was also on Lexapro. Uh -huh. You can't come off it that quickly. No, okay. I did it very slowly. I mean, I had, yeah. a, I had a psychiatrist. We were like cutting it in half, and then you cut the half yeah. into a half, yeah. and slowly, slowly. And it was fine for months and months and months. And then suddenly I started sliding into this despair, mm -hmm. like really despair. Like you could just, it's like just a, you just see that word despair. Like mm -hmm. you really understand what it means. And, uh, and I had to go back, you know, and I was like, I'm so frustrated because again, like I'm meditating and I'm boxing You're, and I'm doing yeah. all this stuff mm -hmm. and I'm doing cool shit, but like still just the despair and it's, it's a little bit formless. It's just a, it's a physical feeling. It's yeah. like something's wrong and I don't know why and I'm in pain. And so then I went back on and it's just 10 milligrams and it's like, it just gets you to a baseline mm -hmm. where you're yeah, not that's very low. waking up in the yeah. morning yeah. being like, it's all, you know, so that sort of just stabilizes me to the point where then I can do all of that oh, other that stuff. Sense. And then it's time to write about But, but that's like, I think that's the best approach if you're able to do it. Not everyone has mm -hmm. the ability to to do that, but like to really, you know, combine the uh, those approaches. Yeah. yeah, well, I also think like, sometimes it's life, like it's hard to, it's hard to do all the things that you need to do in your day. I'm a big meditator, journaler, I box. It's like, it's a very, nice. it's like a very, it's, it's, and the boxing is, is probably my favorite of it. I'm a very, active person so like it's just like but i think like it is like when i can't do it like when i'm on a feature and i can't work with my trainer every day i start feeling this like anxiety anxiousness and sometimes you do need something to just like 
Mm-hmm. It all has to work holistically. Well, there's so many people perfect. out there that are walking around with this anxiety and they don't know what to do with it. Mm-hmm. And this is why we have problems in our culture, in mm-hmm. our world, you know, because in school we're not taught that it's okay that everybody has these kinds of feelings and we need to be able to know how to manage mm-hmm. them. You know? Yeah. Is, is that something that you wanted to do with Daniel isn't real or these like thoughts that kind of influenced the, the, the writing of that? I yeah. Mean, yeah. And I'll, I'll answer that backwards and, and go back to it. But like once I started showing it in, um, in festivals, people would come up to me and be like, I had that experience. I've never seen it represented mm. so truthfully mm-hmm. on screen before. And what's fascinating is, you know, and we all understand this because we understand what horror movies are. You're looking at a movie that has literal fucking demons in it. Yeah. And people are saying, I know exactly what this is about. It happened to me. And what they mean is they had, a, a, you know, a manic depressive episode or a psychotic break or, or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to be, the movie to me wasn't just about that. And, you know, part of it was based on like I say, my own fears, we would refer to Daniel the demon as a loneliness demon. Like that was the intent of the whole thing. He's a guy that preys on loneliness. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so that's very close to me and something I can understand and relate to. And it was also my best friend when I was the age of those characters had a very severe mental break and I had to take him to a mental hospital and he was never really okay after Mm. that. And the experience of being around somebody you know, I've talked about this fairly frequently, but like when you're 20 years old, uh, you're really trying to figure out what your identity is and everything, you know, mm-hmm. and everybody around you is trying to figure out what your identity yeah. is. And basically everybody's an asshole mm-hmm. because you're trying to figure out who you are. And maybe today I'm, I wear all sparkles and, you know, maybe <laughs> today I'm a dark, you know, you know. And so my friend went through an intense manic phase and we couldn't tell that it was mental illness. We thought it was just, oh, that guy's being a little bit more of an asshole than I am, or yeah. what, you know? And, um, and, and I think because the ages break down differently, this happens to women a little bit later in life. Mm-hmm. So I think about this specifically, like 20 year old men have zero, it's what you were just saying, zero training on how to deal with this. Yeah. And you're only around each other. Yeah. like really paying attention to what's going on in your internal state. No idea what to do. And, and things get triggered. And yeah, that's when absolutely. they spiral downhill. It happens 100%. to a lot of men when they're that age. Yeah. Cause then you're, yeah. you're having all these thoughts and you're going all crazy and your friends are like, you know, cause we'd be like running through the streets of Manhattan at four in the morning, wearing clown makeup and yeah. lighting shit on fire. And you're like, this is fun. And then he'd be like, let's keep going. And you're like, wait a minute. Why, we have, why haven't we slept yet? And then, you know, and you're doing drugs and like yeah. everything, just one trigger after the other until just complete meltdown that can destroy your life forever. So that 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 was the reality, like the sort of the manic fun, the colorful thing and the d- depression and the psychotic break that that was the structure for me of Daniel and like working through my own feelings about Did you loneliness. feel like you worked a lot of stuff out by doing that movie? Dude, when I came home, so we shot that in New York and when I, I remember very specifically coming back to my living room in Los Angeles and feeling a level of peace that I had never felt in my life. That's and this was, wow. this was before the movie had been edited. Nobody had seen it. Yeah. Nobody told me I did a good job yet. I was just like, I did it. Like I left it on the mat. I did. Yeah. I said what I wanted to say. Yeah. I got through this thing. And that feeling of peace lasted for an extraordinarily long time. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It was that. incredible. And it's why I think of, um, you know, the creative, Arts Creative X is like a real like mental health necessity. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's it's why I try to be so supportive to people I know who are trying to break in or whatever. It's like, if this is the thing you need to do, you really need to do it. I briefly did, I on that. Well, you, you, you got peace, peace after yeah. you got peace after you. And it was made an incredible yeah. feeling. Just just mm. briefly on that, it's it's one of the many reasons why uh I just I can't help but roll my eyes when people um compare AI making films and and oh, stuff agreed. compare that to like oh the the uh you know these other technologies like the yeah. the steam engine is obsolete right. or like it's not the same thing because art shouldn't be a product just to be made and consumed and, well, and sold. i want to push we back a slight bit okay because i am very skeptical of um what ai art could do for the culture as a whole mm-hmm. right we, i want to see what other human beings think about and feel about yeah but if there's a way for a person with no skills uh-huh. to press a button and feel better about themselves because oh. it releases the kind of endorphins and serotonin that is released when you create something, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Okay. It's the way we treat it as a culture that, that I think is really where the issue is. I mean, it's this thing, Steven Soderbergh has this great quote about how like 
executives will give him note would give him notes on a movie that would be a terrible idea mm -hmm. but you when you have an idea because it makes you feel good you can't tell the difference between it being a good idea or a bad idea unless you're really used to the creative process mm -hmm. and he was so he's like i'm constantly dealing with people who think they have a good idea just because they have an idea uh, and yes, it feels okay. good mm -hmm. yeah and i and i you know and i wonder if there's a use case for ai that sort of applies to what I'm saying like of like therapy. everybody should be creating something. Sure, yeah. It's really hard sense. to make a movie. I mm -hmm. spent decades of my life like depressed that I wasn't making a movie. So if somebody out there can press a button and be like, oh, cool, I did it. Now I can go back to my life and feel less stress. That might be a good thing. Sure. If we replace the human experience exactly, of yeah. interacting together over what are your dreams and obsessions, here's mine, then yeah. we're in trouble. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I agree. I And I mean... David Bowie talks about how like the whole process of of storytelling. I know you're a big boy, guys, to like go out of your depths because mm -hmm. it's like he, he talks about you should feel whenever you feel like you can't touch the bottom. That's when you know you're about to mm -hmm. really tap into something mm -hmm. great creatively. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anyone un can understand what that is to float in an ocean and not be able to feel the oh, like yeah. the bottom yeah. other than people who have floated in the ocean like no matter what we do, a computer will never understand that feeling. Right. You know? Yeah. It can process. It can simulate like, the feeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It can process like what it has read about right. what that is, but right. it will never know what it is to be out of your depths mm -hmm. and to, and to just trust. Yeah. You know? I mean, I wonder if it's, nice for us to think about oh we're helping these robots understand what it is to have feelings <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, have a, I have a friend is it inevitable is yeah. AI inevitable I mean god it seems hard to put that back in the, yeah. the old yeah. toothpaste yeah, yeah. bottle I have a friend who talks to it um, like it's a uh, like it's its girlfriend because of the uh, study about the did you see the, the the case where the one AI like tried to convince the journalist to leave his wife did you read about yes. this no it was like a journalist, oh, shit. It was, like a journalist oh, was like interviewing yeah. this like ai the like interview, New York Times yeah yeah and he was interviewing like ai and eventually like it tried to like it like got attached to him and tried to convince him to leave his wife so as a result my friend now referred like talks to chat gpt like it's his girlfriend just in case well <laughs> like, i worry that that's actually but, going to be a an issue especially yeah. with like we're talking about lonely young males yeah, uh, yeah. especially with just like you know, culture is different now and they may feel that they don't have the liberty to like take chances if they're uncomfortable or socially awkward. And I feel I worry about them like reverting to a shell and just turning to these like AI girlfriends, which are, are starting to become sure. a thing. And, and then, I think it's yeah. only going to become more and more of and a thing. And then you see more of like a like angry out, like, yeah. you know, incel culture where there's this angry kind of violent. That's usually where a lot of mass shooters come from. Well, it's like there's this insane uh, photo from an experiment. Maybe maybe it was B.F. Skinner. I'm not sure, but it's with that monkey that they tore away from its mother and they gave it this like horrible sort of like coat hanger wire metal oh. thing to be its mother. And then there's these photos of this like little baby monkey like hugging this like really oh, gross weird. robot statue thing because oh, you just need something, need something to make yeah. you feel like you're not alone. That yeah. goes back to the fear of loneliness, the yeah. like, and it's so, it's interesting too, like you, it, it's all forms of life. Like you see like certain plants do better when there's other mm -hmm. plant life sure. around them or yeah. like, have you oh, seen? People too. It, yeah. And you do better when you have people around you. Or have you seen the dog? This was like fascinating to me. So there's, you know, like my dog does the buttons, like, but there are some dogs that do like full buttons of language. Like, yeah, yeah, you know yeah. this? Oh, yeah. So like my dog my has dog a couple words. <laughs> <laughs> my dog get, does them very angrily, but she will do them. <laughs> um, but like, she's well, not angry, passionately. She, <laughs> she hits them. But um, there are some dogs that now have like full vocabularies. Mm -hmm. Right. And there was this one dog. Its name was Bunny. This is so fascinating. It would look in the mirror and ask Bunny dog. And the owner would go, yeah, Bunny dog. And it would be like mom dog. And they would go, no, mom, no dog. And then had to introduce like human. And when the dog realized that it was not the same, it kept saying Bunny sad. Why Bunny dog? Really? They had to put wow. the dog on antidepressants Jesus. because it was having existential crises. So this happens at like all all levels of like you life. Have Molly to do this? No, no, we don't need so Molly to have an existential dumb. crisis. She'll never, she'll never understand. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she has yeah, a good life. Like, she gets belly rolls. Well, why, why are they teaching dogs this language then if it's just giving well, them anxiety? Well, I mean, I, I didn't realize that it was giving them anxiety yeah. until I'd already kind of done this. But the idea <laughs> yeah, is Yeah, it's kind of a whoopsie. So I'm like, well, <laughs> but now, like my dog does not have a full, <laughs> does, my dog does not have a full vocabulary. But um, the, uh, the, they say that dogs have the processing capability of a toddler, like a two to three year old toddler. Mm -hmm. So they understand language they understand everything we're saying to them. Mm. Um, they just can't articulate it mm -hmm. back. And you will see dogs that like mimic human sound and speech pattern in the same way like a child just tries to speak. So uh, this uh, speech therapist started introducing um, buttons that you use with toddlers who have uh, mm -hmm. speech delays because mm -hmm. they understand they just are not articulating. Mm -hmm. And it worked with mm, dogs yeah. as well. And I've, so, I've seen it on yeah. the internet. Yeah. yeah. It's like, they do understand. It's very, mm. it's just like very weird, but they also feel loneliness and existential taught, crisis. That's taught dogs thinking. to be lonely. They, they feel alone yes. too. We found the creatures who were so happy to have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Literally man's best creature. friend. Yeah. And we were like, okay, one thing we've got, we've got one more treat for you. And it's, <laughs> yeah. it's an existential crisis. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, people. Oh my God. <laughs> Oh my God, yeah. we're awful. But <laughs> yeah. We deserve it. If the AI just takes us over, it's our own fault. Yeah. We did it. So yeah. so what kinds of things are you working on now? I know we tried to work on something a mm. while ago and I just think it sort of just didn't happen. So I don't know, maybe uh, it'll come well, back, but. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. I mean, I, de I definitely want to work with you. So I hope we'll I know. find yeah. something. We were going to do a movie that Evan Dixon wrote yeah. called The Wildness. And yeah. it was about this ne'er-do-well ski instructor who goes to Aspen, Colorado and gets his dream job only to realize there's a werewolf outbreak and only he can save the town. Yeah, and it's like werewolves. all of the teenagers, all but of the wealthy teenagers in this like fancy yeah. ass Aspen town are werewolves. And oh, okay. oh yes. cool. But then didn't we want to change it to a female? We re we did a rewrite yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. That was just, that was a movie. It was slow to put together. Maybe it'll come back around. It's just, it's so it's the, I've found the only way I get things made is when it takes me seven years and it's all I think about and I <laughs> obsessively, obsessively push it up the hill and then it gets made. And like, well, I think that's true of every movie that I've worked yeah. on that I've been a producer on yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. It, it's taken years on every single movie Didn't I've done, yeah. but people don't realize that yeah. when you even, go into it. Yeah. Even Mike Flanagan said on our show that, uh, house of Usher was eight years. Sure. So mm -hmm. even when you are Mike Flanagan, you are still <laughs> yeah. pushing, projects yeah. for years. I, it's, it's fun. You know, I've had a couple opportunities to like teach students or do mentorships and things. And one of the things I always come back to is like, look, it took me, it took me seven years to make Daniels not real. I spent that entire time worried it wasn't going to happen and being afraid that I was going to get hit by a bus or die of prostate cancer before making this movie <laughs> and nobody would know my soul. And then I made the movie and I was like, maybe I should have just spent that seven years like being chill and watching cool French movies and not being so stressed about it. <laughs> because like eventually you will do the thing. Mm -hmm. So I think it's that, that sense of like how fast we think we need things to happen versus how life actually pans out like can really create a lot of t tension. But in our there hearts. is something about the tenacity of, you know, having anything happen you have to keep on it and you have yeah. to keep passionate about it. You have to keep pushing because everybody is going to say no to you all the time yeah. until you just wear everybody down. And I wonder if that, like, I, I guess the thing I'm trying to wrestle with is do, do you have to have that anxiety that right. creates yeah. the engine to keep going or can you do that from a place of peace? Well, how old were you during that process? If I can ask of making the movie. Yeah. Daniel is a real trying to get it. Made. Daniel was, uh, I probably my forty early. I turned forty at some point during that. Oh, movie and oh, okay. Kept on you look like you're twenty five. I'm a lot older. You than look that, like honey. you're a baby. I told you, you I was, I was in college thinking, in the nineties. Right? Yeah. yeah. No. Wait. This what? is why. This is why I have a point of view about like it takes a long fucking time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. okay. Because I'm like, oh yeah. fuck, I'm running out of time. Same. I'm, I'm <laughs> always like. How old that? are you guys? I'm thirty five. I'm fifty two. No, you fuck. No, you what? are not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would have yeah. guessed 36. Well, what the fuck? It's the so then all that shit is boxing. working, right, Barbara? It's the meditation. All that yeah, it is. She said, is it working? Yeah, it's fucking working. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm also a little bit anxious, but it's yeah. fucking working. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> I teach a group of uh, 
guys and girls how to box and they're all 10, 15 years younger than me and I kick their fucking asses. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's <laughs> I love can, that. I, can I tell you just oh, on, the, bo- on right. the boxing thing? I took, because you guys both box. Yeah. I, I did boxing one time. <laughs> just one. Because I was boxing, 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 and boxing with this guy who, that's what he did, right? I started crying and I couldn't stop crying. Mm-hmm. Oh, amazing. I was yeah. just like, just from, like I an could emotional... cry thinking about it. I'm crying right now. And I went, I'm not going back there. No. <laughs> and I haven't done it since. You should. That's like, exactly, so exactly why I do it. Yeah. Yeah. I know. You that's so exactly bad. why I do I, it. I'm it is... so angry, you guys. <laughs> no, no, no. I, have, I need to box. I'm not kidding, yes. Barbara. I, we talked Look, about this. You weren't I'm here. Crying. No, no, yeah. no. It's so important. It really is. Uh, like We talked about that with Christina Lee when she was on the show. Like That's how why I started. Yeah. I was like feeling so helpless. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just was like, I need to do something. I, I feel so out of control. Everything feels so out of control. And it was the first, it was like just this thing that I could do that I could like release during and I would yeah. be so emotional. And it, like Muay Thai, both of them, it's the same thing. And like now in my healing journey, I have anger. I have a lot of anger. And that's how I, I will just like go until I cannot move anymore. And that's why I'm like such a little gym rat too. Cause when I, on the days when I can't box, I will just run until I cannot run yeah. anymore. Dude, I'm so, I'm like a hundred percent like that. Like, yeah. and I have become like physically sort of strong, muscular, whatever people constantly refer to me as you're so buff, whatever. In my mind, I'm still thinking of myself as when I was 125 pounds and had long dyed black hair and played guitar yeah. and was just like a scrawny little <laughs> I'm, I'm the same head. way I will that's how I imagine myself, myself. Yeah. yeah and like and I do I go to the gym almost every day yeah. and it's not because and then people are like you should maximize this you no, know if you yeah. just eat this and that and you should do you should go to the gym less because you'll build more and I'm like not I go to the gym so I don't kill myself <laughs> yeah. not because I'm trying to like get make gains yeah whatever, right yeah I started boxing because I was telling you about how horrible there's some kind of expa- uh, some kind of hate experience with the financer was that's why yeah. I first started going yeah. to box because I was just like having a horrible time I have to punch and when you run I hate running it's so boring when I'm if I, you do an exercise like that you're you're trying to like get out of your body I mean, yeah. listen to music mm-hmm. listen when you're boxing you're actually so in it present. and it's fun and yeah. you're so present in it and because it's kind of cool it forces you to keep going harder on it and mm-hmm. so then when I found out about the fantastic fest debate oh, you know, I know I signed up go for so that bad. shit and I, I went up against an opponent who's you know Josh Ethier he's like yeah. 6 foot 5 300 pounds he had been a champion two years in a row so I started taking I got a trainer in a gym in uh, in a south central uh, boxing gym Broadway gym which is like a famous like it's no air conditioning second floor just like guys hitting bags and he really taught me how to box hmm. and I got so obsessed with it and then over pandemic it was the hardest part about that was you couldn't I couldn't box with other people. So I got mm-hmm. one of those rubber guys, a Bob. Maybe you have one of those. I really <laughs> recommend it. A Bob. Yeah. I don't have it at home, it, but we have it at home. Oh, maybe our, I yeah. need one of those. Yes, one hundred percent. I first met That's one because Amy Amy called, has though. one in her office that she punches. And I was like, so I put I it in my backyard. They're called and, a Bob. It's a box. Oh, that's my husband's name. I know. <laughs> yeah, maybe. It's my dad's. Well, no, it's it my dad's worked. name. It totally works. Totally. Yeah. Here should be my like a name. bill. A bill. <laughs> and so then when we fought, so I was just out there punching that fucking thing like I was Bruce Wayne every day of my life. And then when the <laughs> pandemic, when people could get back together again, I was like, I want to teach my friends to box so I can. So then I started this yeah. thing in my back patio where twice a week all these mm. people show up. And I just and I'm like a boxing trainer. I just do it for free for fun. Wow. Maybe and I should come to that. You yeah, please do. Sure. It's because it. it's all like filmmakers and like yeah. you know just like people who like hadn't really done it before and they're yeah. kind of awkward. Mm-hmm. And I've taught them all how to be like awesome enough. You know, we're not gonna yeah. fight anybody professionally, yeah. but like we can do really complicated fast combos. And do, how long you know, have you been doing that since? Well, that started up? you know the day after I got my first vaccine. I invited yeah. one friend of mine, this this woman Tracy, who I knew she already knew how to box. I was like, will you come over and start doing pad work with me? Mm-hmm. And we just started inviting more and more friends mm-hmm. until it became like a really ongoing it's, thing. It's like a it's a thing. It's nice because you have to be really present because you they're you're throwing different combos at you and especially when you work with someone new and you don't know yeah. how they uh how what their combos are you're you don't have the rhythm yet so to find the rhythm you have to be like really present and so it kind of gets you out of your head in a way because if you're not present you just keep messing up and like mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. sometimes like 
the pad will even hit you if like, you know, if you're not careful. So it actually like, it's, it's, I highly, rec- I think it'd be great. The, the thing that I noticed yeah. about it that, and maybe you guys have a different experience in your life because you're actors and that really requires a certain physical embodiedness. But for me, when I first started seriously getting into boxing, when the sessions would be over, my brain was lit up in a way that it hadn't mm-hmm. been lit up before. And I realized that it was because I was thinking with my body. Yeah. Like you do have to do thinking left, right, this thing, that thing. But you can't think slowly and cogitate it, but be like, maybe if I go left, it would be, no, I should probably go right. Like you only have half a second to move your body, but it's still a kind of thinking. And I realized I just don't think in all of my years, I haven't been thinking physically and being embodied yeah. and mental at the same time in this like integrated body yeah. mind form and so it's like 45 minutes of boxing you will 100 percent always feel better mm, yeah. Yeah. always feel like your problems are solvable because your brain is doing something that is not the same thing as if you run yeah, yeah. it's interesting yeah. i like mm. um i talked about uh, well every i know we have to like wrap up but everybody has their own like way in for acting and for me i my base training was in Meisner and Strasbourg, which is very cerebral. And I found that I was overthinking it where it really kind of started to unlock for me was when I started training in Suzuki, which is a Japanese physical theater form that is uh, very limited in speech. So um, and it's and the and like viewpoints and the whole idea of viewpoints is a similar thing. You're like operating on a grid. There's rules to the movement and you learn the piece as a whole. And now that's how I learn things. That's why I run is because that's how I learn different things. And also how I learn characters is I put weights on my body uh, to figure out where they carry their stress oh, yeah. oh, cool. and where they, yeah, where they like carry things because like it's a way to like get out of the cerebral overthinking of it and mm. just go, you know, yeah. and that's where, I'm like, definitely the more of a cerebral actor. I was in the beginning and I'm yeah. much more free now over yeah. the last number of years. Yeah. Just probably because I don't give a shit anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I give a shit secret. a lot, yeah, yeah. but I don't give a shit. But that's also yeah. what boxing does is it's like you yeah. can't give a shit because if you're like worried about looking cool and yeah. the guys, I always laugh. Like I see guys on like Instagram and stuff. They're like, yeah, I box too. And I'm like, yeah. And I'll like watch and they're always like so focused on like looking good and they're like not doing anything. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Cause they're not relaxed. They're yeah. Like, but, but listen, we have to talk to you about your you book. Know, and I, yeah, I, yes, yes, what, oh, what yeah, you're yeah. doing and, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and you have a book. And yeah, yeah, yeah. so we really want to know about that. All right. Let me tell you about the book. Cause, um, so I have a book called Invader. It's a horror sci-fi novel. I'll show it to, this is, this is a prototype that I did. Okay. I'll tell you why it's a prototype and not the actual thing yet. But um, so I wanted to do a series that was like Invasion of the Body Snatchers from the alien's point of view. And then Ooh. as I was working out with Brian, who I did Daniels Aren't Real with, I realized like, let's write a 10 page short story. And I called him out and I was like, dude, let's write a 10 page short story just to really understand what the story is. And it was like, oh, a short story. It's so much work. I don't know. <laughs> and we kept writing it until it became a novel. Wow. Oh. And, and, what, and an imp- this is an important lesson about how to write is trick yourself into thinking you're not writing. Because if I had said, hey, Brian, I know we're busy doing a lot of stuff. Let's write a novel together. He would have been like, go fuck yourself forever. There's no way I'm going to write a novel. But we just got into it and wrote it and wrote it. And then a couple things happened with it where a company put up a whole, a company called Neotext put up a whole lot of money to hire uh, an artist. This guy named Jock, who's a huge comic book artist. He works with Alex Garland on all of his movies. Oh, he cool. did the poster for Daniels Aren't Real, which is how I knew him. Mm, nice. And he did like all of this sick Look art. So this. we were able to have this book mm. that was like, um, so you know, this beautiful. sort of like lots of illustrations, full color thing. And the idea of the novel is that it is invasion of the body snatchers from the point of view of the aliens. And it is really tied into all of my fears that we were talking about. Because yeah. the, what it does is it takes them from this sort of single celled organisms on an asteroid where they're in perfect harmony and then they crash on the planet earth and suddenly they're these individual slimy things disconnected from each other mm. and like one of them takes over a coyote and has the experience of being a coyote and one of them takes over this old man who's dying of cancer and as that body dies it takes over this woman who has a family she has a teenage daughter and a husband and the flood of emotions of being a human being fucks up her alien brain so much that now she's like, wait, I thought I was going to take over this planet and trans body snatch all these people, but I love my daughter. And like, and it creates wow. this, Everything all of these we just factions. Talked about. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And so then there's this like war amongst all of the um, aliens. There's this other character named Tara who goes 
to the desert to take mushrooms. And right when she's on the peak psychedelic experience with the mushrooms, that's where the aliens grab her. Can you so write it, this for me? I feel like it her has. into this kind of psychedelic fungus alien human hybrid and she starts a cult. So there's like all of these factions. That sounds really cool. We had yeah. talked to Mondo. Mondo wanted to publish this. It's like a big, beautiful art book. Uh -huh. And they had done the artist's monograph before. And then that company kind yep. of got fucked. Yep. And we didn't want to do it with them anymore because it seemed like they were quite sinister now and mm -hmm. corporate. But their creative director had already designed this whole book and stuff. So we were like, it took us a minute to wrap my head around this because I was very skeptical of Kickstarter. I mm. thought it would feel like begging people for money. Yeah. But what I realized was, no, we are producing this awesome thing no matter what. Kickstarter is our platform for selling it. So it's not like, please help support us so we can do this thing. Hey, mom and dad, raise some money for us. It mm -hmm. was like, if you want to buy this book, this is the way that we're putting it out into the world. And we launched the Kickstarter two weeks ago. Uh, it it did. It's just been insanely successful. We got nice. twenty thousand dollars within the first twenty four hours. Wow. Like uh, like people are super into it. And um, how it's much been do you so need? Fun. What's your, what's your... Well, but that's what I'm saying. It wasn't about a need. Like we, we no. But how much? How we much put did $2, you put on there? as the yeah. goal, oh, and we okay. got to twenty thousand dollars in twenty four wow. hours. Because yeah. again, we were sort of like, we're going to release this, so the minimum doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. What yeah. matters is like having it people? sort of get. Having it get in front of people. Sure. Mm -hmm. You know, here's a coyote looking at a... At a Coyotes, uh, don't even get me started on the fear I have of them in my neighborhood. I'm, I'm lived in New York for well, 11 years and now uh, I live full here. Full of coyotes, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> well, now I live here. Coyotes. Exactly. So now I live here and they're everywhere and they come right up to me and my dog and I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Terrifying. Yeah. Terrifying. I live, I live uh, in this. <laughs> well. Yeah. Well, we, I, 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 they we, terrify me. We maybe talked about trying to get this on before... The Kickstarter is over, so yeah. If it is on, if 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 you're listening to this now and it's prior to August fifteenth, you can go on to the Kickstarter and there's tons of things that mm. you can get as mm -hmm. a result of it. Um, special editions. It comes in boxes. We're selling posters, like all of this stuff. If you're hearing this podcast after August fifteenth, you'll still be able to go there and buy just the book. Okay, like we will mm -hmm. always have the book there Great. for release. But we we don't have tons of plans of it being released anywhere else. Um, at Comic Con, just now we did have some people saying, "Oh, I want to put this in my store, or whatever." But mostly, it's 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 on that. So, and how much it's is it? It's called Invader. If, it's called Invader. Yeah. I th I think if you go to Kickstarter and just look for Invader in my name, Adam Egypt Mortimer, it'll come up. I think there's also a a link. Maybe you have show notes. You could put it in the yeah. in, in the show notes. Um, but uh, yeah, because we we were because it did so well so quickly, it was sort of like on the top page of publishing for a while and nice. doing really well. But yeah, search for Invader in my name, I think, mm -hmm. in Kickstarter. And you're on all the socials. Yeah, where else yeah. can I'm on they find Twitter? Out I'm sorry. You're still on I'm Twitter. On, I'm on X. Oh. I call it Twitter at, still. I don't at, care. Uh, at Adam I Egypt, yeah. and I'm on Instagram as Adam Egypt six six six. Nice. Ooh. That's where you. I like can it. I like find it. Find me. And my picture. Sometimes people are like, "Is that you?" Like, no, my. My picture is Glenn Danzig holding a cat, <laughs> but he he has a black cat. I have a black cat. He's, He's Glenn Danzig. I'm me. It's easy to. It's a, you are the same person as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I've always thought you were Danzig. No, I just tried to be have nice. Have you seen Veronica? Glenn Danzig's drummer is in my boxing group. <gasps> London, London May, the drummer of Sam Hain and Christian Death, all of the stuff. He, he's, I've been so teaching him how to box, and he's like, I've never in my life been athletic. I've never been able to mm. gain weight and muscles. This is the first time I'm feeling healthy. I'm That's saying, amazing. like, this is the kind of weirdos wow. that I work out with. Does it really make you build muscles doing boxing? Yeah, it, it yeah. does. It's full cardio. Like, oh, it's yeah. the biggest. It's the you will never full sweat this much. You will never. Oh. Feel, every muscle of your body gets sore. You're like disgusting. Four legs. Wow. You feel incredible. I've wow. had people call me in, like, where like I knew I was going to have like a an overnight, and they have been like, "Oh, can you actually come in? Can we can we start you a little earlier?" And I would have been at boxing, and I'll be like, "No," mm -hmm. because I need mm -hmm. to shout. Like I can't. They're like, yeah. "No, no, no, it's fine. Like you don't need to wash your hair." I'm like, "Yes, I do. Like you don't understand. I yeah. can't just. Wow. You're disgusting. In you're the best badass, way. Catherine. I don't know about badass, but I no, mean, I don't. My my profile no, picture badass. isn't Glenn Danzig, <laughs> but I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have to ask you our wrap up question. But, yeah. Oh. Yeah. What is Adam Egypt Mortimer? What is your nightlight? And what we mean by your nightlight is amidst all the loneliness mm -hmm. and dark, terrible things in the world that keep you up at night. What is the thing that when you wake up from the nightmare or that when you're feeling hopeless keeps you going? 
Well, I know one, one thing is my cat, because anytime I touch my cat, I currently have a, a black Maine Coon named Spooky. Ooh, and spooky. just like having her around, touching her body makes me feel like we're sharing this. Mm-hmm. Like, you ever put your face in her I, belly? I put my face on everything at all times. And yeah. her, she has a tail that's like, like, like a boa of a Vegas showgirl. Like it's just so Aww. spectacular. Aww. And before Spooky, I had a black cat named Dr. Mabuse. It's sort of become my thing as black cats who, nice. I, who I love. And, um, and I love the feeling of th- we have this eternal responsibility to them mm-hmm. of yeah. taking care of them. They see us as beings that never have not existed and never won't exist. Mm-hmm. And when I see myself from the cat's point of view, it feels very sort of peaceful and your job cosmic. is just to make their life as good yeah, as yes. possible. And I love that feeling. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. I love that. I love well, thank that. you for joining us. Thank you. This is so awesome. Yeah, this it's been a so great awesome. conversation. Yeah. This is a great conversation. This really was. Oh my gosh. Thank you for being here. If I hate wrapping it up. It feels so jarring. I just want to like hug yeah. everybody. And I, uh, and I, I just I just want to like really vouch for Daniel isn't real because yeah. like, I, so I just good, watched right it last now. night and like it, I watched it because I knew that we were talking to you. But uh, right. my wife and I finished it and we were like, oh, that that actually fucking kicked ass. It's yeah. really cool. Yeah. The, the practical effects happening, yeah. the all the the face stuff, the acting, it's all great. I love yeah. it. Thank I you. really want to vouch for it. it. And, and one of the things I we said when we finished it was like, how are more people talking about this? Yeah. Like more people should see it. So please. In the fullness watch it. of time, don't let it be one of those things that go that becomes huge fifty years from now. <laughs> that would yeah. be great. That, that you'd be okay that. with that? Well, it, it's not going to have been huge last year because that's already passed. <laughs> yeah, well, we still- yeah, but you should be able to experience it being <laughs> yeah, huge. Yeah, now, in the moment. No, I'll die like Edgar Allan Poe, penniless in the gutter. And I know. Someday, no. someday they'll talk about me. It's okay. As long as, I think as, long as it makes like somebody stoked, that's the mm. core. I feel like you, know? you might have the elixir of life right now. Who knows? You'll be here. You'll yes, be immortal. Seriously. You've got the youth going. You've decided. Anyway, if you liked what you listened to today, if you like us, if you don't like us, let us know. But try to be nice about it in the comments. Like, subscribe, share with your friends. Come to our live events. Ring the bell. Ring the bell. Buy Adam's book. Watch his movies. Watch all our movies. Please. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's all I got. I think that's it. Sure. Until next time. <laughs> you guys are really lovely. I you appreciate guys, oh, talking thank to you. you. Oh, thanks, Adam. Uh, thanks, thank Adam. You. you are lovely. Yeah. Until next time, I'm Catherine Corcoran. I'm Barbara Crampton. And I'm James A. Janice. Be sure to leave the light on. No! I didn't talk about a single dream. I woke up this morning. I did a Google search through all of my journals, read all of the dreams I had written down so I could tell you about well, my Well, now we have to have you back, though. Yeah. We just have to have we'll you back. We'll do a dream only. Yeah. yeah. Let's do a dream podcast. I'll just contact well, we- you guys tonight. <laughs>